Well, good morning. We are so glad that you are all here. Thank you for joining us this beautiful November 1st morning. For those of you that are joining with us electronically, we're so glad that you're able to uh, kind of catch up with us and come in. I have one announcement for the electronic uh, group, those of you that are local. Um, hopefully next week, it looks like it's going to be pretty good, but next week our desire is to have a sectioned off area within our church upstairs that is going to be designed for those that may have weaker immune systems that have to be masked. So there's going to be a small room where we could probably fit up to 8, 10, 15 people at the most. And so what we're going to do is we're going to encourage you folks, if you're local in the area and you would like to, it will be a mask on, a whole service. You guys are going to be, I hate to call it segregated, but protected. Um, and so uh, we're looking forward to that. If you're, if you're still not able to come and, and you're able to connect with us electronically, we're so appreciative. We're so appreciative. Let's pray. Amen. Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much, God, that you are working in our midst. And God, if you were not working in our midst, what a waste of time. And so God, I cry out to you this morning, we're flesh and blood and we need you. As a matter of fact, as I'm going to share a little later on, that you said in your word, you are the vine, we're the branch. And Lord, apart from you, we can do nothing and so, Father, I ask, not only here in this facility, Lord, but also there in people's homes or wherever it is that they're watching, I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would use this time in worship and song uh, to uh, minister to the folks uh, and also to draw them close to you as we worship. You said that you would inhabit the praises of your people. And so, God, no matter where we are this morning, I pray that we would begin to praise you this morning. You are worthy of our praise. You are so worthy of our praise. And Lord God, I pray as the word is brought forth a little uh, later after the time of worship, God, I pray for your anointing upon the word as well, because God, it's your word, it's your Bible that gives us teaching according to, to bring us to you for life and liberty. And Lord, we are so, gr so grateful for your word. And so God, I just thank you and I praise you in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said... Amen. Why don't you stand with us, and if you're at home, you can sit, stand, doesn't make any difference. If you're on a lazy boy or a couch, just pray that your heart is right and ready, and uh, just allow God to inhabit your praises. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah.
Oh. 
lamb is overcome we sing hallelujah we sing hallelujah we sing hallelujah the lamb is overcome we sing hallelujah yourself in that place could you imagine being there could you imagine being one of the guards if you can't imagine it then sing with us please the ground began to shake the stone was rolled away is perfect love to God be overcome. Now death, where is your sting? Our resurrected King has rendered you defeat. Hallelujah.
If you have your Bibles and you'd like to turn with me to Acts, the 10th chapter, that would be wonderful. Hallelujah. So this morning, I know most of you in here at least have heard me say this before, and so for those of you that are watching by uh, internet, Facebook Live, whatever, um, we're going to be taking a, like a 40,000 uh, foot look at Acts, the 10th chapter. Uh, so in other words, I'm going to read the entire chapter, but I will not go verse by verse this morning um, for you. <laughs> but there's some things that I felt like God wanted me to just talk about this morning from this chapter. So let's begin at verse 1. There are 48 verses, so bear with me as I read through it. And uh, I'm going to touch on some things uh, after uh, we read. And uh, this lamp up here is actually for illustrative purposes, just so you know. Now, there was a certain man at uh, Caesarea named Cornelius, a centurion of what was called the Italian cohort, a devout man and one who feared God with all his household and gave many alms to the Jewish people and prayed to God continually. About the ninth hour of the day, he clearly saw in a vision an angel of God who had just come in and said to him, Cornelius. By the way, the ninth hour of the day is around 3 p.m., just so you know. It's kind of interesting. Verse 4, And fixing his gain upon him, being much alarmed, he said, What is it, Lord? And he said to him, Your prayers and alms have ascended as a memorial before God. And now dispatch some men to Joppa and send for a man named Simon, who is also called Peter. He is staying with a certain tanner named Simon, whose house is by the sea. When the angel who was speaking to him had departed, he summoned two of his servants and a devoted soldier of those who were in constant attendance upon him. And after he had explained everything to them, he sent them to Joppa. And on the next day, as they were on their way the approach, and approaching the city, Peter went up on the housetop about the sixth hour to pray. And he became hungry. Sixth hour, by the way, is noontime. And he became hungry and was desiring to eat. But while they were making preparations, he fell into a trance. And behold, the sky opened up, and a certain object, like a great sheet coming down, lowered by four corners to the ground. And there were in it all kinds of four-footed animals and crawling creatures of the earth and birds of the air. And a voice came to him, Arise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, By no means, Lord, for I have never eaten anything unholy and unclean. And again a voice came to him a second time, What God has cleansed no longer consider unholy. And this happened three times. And immediately the object was taken up into the sky. Now, while Peter was greatly perplexed in mind as to what the vision which he had seen might be, behold, the men who had been sent by Cornelius, having asked directions for Simon's house, appeared at the gate. And calling out, they were asking whether Simon, who was also called Peter, was staying there. And while Peter was reflecting on the vision, the Spirit said to him, Behold, three men are looking for you, but arise, go downstairs, and accompany them without misgivings, for I have sent them myself. And Peter went down to the men and said, Behold, I am the one you are looking for. What is the reason for which you have come? And they said, Cornelius, a centurion, a righteous and God-fearing man, well spoken of by the entire nation of the Jews, was divinely directed by a holy angel to send for you to come to his house and hear a message from you. So he invited them in and, they gave, and gave them lodging. And on the next day he arose and went away with them, and some of the brethren from Joppa accompanied him. And on the following day he entered Caesarea. Now, Corne now Cornelius was waiting for them and had called together his relatives and close friends. And when it came about that Peter entered, Cornelius met him and fell at his feet and worshipped him. But Peter raised him up, saying, Stand up, I too am just a man. And as he talked with him, he entered and found many people assembled. And he said to them, You yourselves know how unlawful it is for a man who is a Jew to associate with a foreigner or to visit him. And yet God has shown me that I should not call any man unholy or unclean. That is why I came without raising any objection when I was sent for. And so I asked for what reason you have sent for me. 
Cornelius said, four days ago to this hour, I was praying in my house during the ninth hour, and behold, a man stood before me in shining garments. And he said, Cornelius, your prayer has been heard, and your alms have been remembered before God. Send therefore to Joppa, and invite Simon, who is also called Peter, to come to you. He is staying at the house of Simon the Tanner by the sea. And so I sent to you immediately, and you have been kind enough to come. Now then, we are all here present before God to hear all that you have been commanded by the Lord. And opening his mouth, Peter said, I most certainly understand now that God is not one to show partiality, but in every nation the man who fears him and does what is right is welcome to him. The word which he sent to the sons of Israel, preaching peace through Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. You yourselves know the thing which took place throughout all Judea, starting from Galilee after the baptism which John proclaimed. You know of Jesus the Nazareth, of Nazareth, how God anointed him with the Holy Spirit and with power, and how he went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. And we were witnesses of all these things. He did both in the land of the Jews and in the Jerusalem. And they also put him to death by hanging him on a tree. God raised him up on the third day and granted that he should become visible, not to all the people, but to witnesses who were chosen beforehand by God, that is, to us who ate and drank with him after he arose from the dead. And he ordered us to preach to the people and solemnly to testify that this is the one who had been anointed by God as judge, excuse me, appointed by God as judge of the living and the dead. Of him all the prophets bear witness that through his, his name, everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins. While Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit fell on all those who were listening to the message. And all the circumcised believers who had come with Peter were amazed because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out upon the Gentiles also. For they were hearing them speaking with tongues and exalting God. Then Peter answered, Surely no one can refuse the water for these to be baptized who have received the Holy Spirit just as we did, can he? And he ordered them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Then they asked him to stay on for a few days. Now, chapter 10 takes four days to accomplish. I don't know if you guys realize that. So, where Peter was in Joppa, to go to Caesarea was about a 96-mile hike. Now, remember, we learned last week that he had gone 60 miles to lay hands on those to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. They didn't have cars back then. Talk about somebody committed to the Lord, to do the work of the Lord. Hallelujah. Because I don't know about you, but I have a beautiful Harley that I ride. And when I ride for, you know, 100 miles, I got to pull over because I'm sore like if I got off a horse. Could you imagine these guys actually riding a horse or a camel or something all that way? They were committed. They were committed. And it also happened on rainy days. I don't like riding my motorcycle in the rain unless I have no choice. These guys were committed. Now, it didn't say it was during any rainy season or whatever, but I just wanted to point out some things. Now, if I were to ask you, who is the main character in chapter 10 of the book of Acts, who would you say? Who? Cornelius, who else? God. You would be correct. How many of you know that God is actually the main character of the entire scriptures from Genesis to Revelation, every verse, every chapter, every... He is the theme. Amen? Why is this important? Because you remember when Cornelius met with him? What did he do? He fell down to worship him. Did you know to elevate a human being above where he's supposed to be is idol worship? And that's breaking one of God's commands. You should never, ever... Ever, 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 ever. Those of you who buy television, ever, ever. You should never bow down to any person that's got flesh suit on. That's reserved for the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? Hallelujah. We read it throughout Scripture. Don't you ever elevate anybody, anywhere, ever, to a place where they don't belong especially self-elevation. Amen? Hallelujah. Now, I want to show you my lamp. Well, it's not my lamp. I don't even know whose lamp it is. It's just a pretty little lamp. It's missing a couple things, like a, a little hood. But you know what's interesting about this lamp? 
This lamp has a 13-watt bulb in it. And so when it's a fluorescent 13-watt bulb, one of these kinds, it actually is pretty bright. But if you'll notice, it's not working right now. As a matter of fact, if I were to switch this 13-watt and put an incandescent 100-watt bulb in right now and did this, it's, it's not working. Stupid lamp. Time to throw the thing away. It's not working. Reminds me of a story one time I heard. Now, I'm French, so just bear with me. It's, it is what it is. This is the story I heard. So this logger, we'll call him Kevin, decided to go and uh, buy himself a new saw because, you know, he needed to keep up with things. So he went into the local s store and he said to the uh, fellow that was over there, and he said, listen, I need a new saw. He said, the saw I have now is just not working well. And so he says, I need to cut many, many cords. And so he said, well, we've got this nice John Sered saw here, and this thing... You know, if you're good with it, you can cut you a cord in no time at all. Just keep the blade sharp. He said, okay, I'll take it. So what does he do? He goes home. About three weeks later, he comes back. He's got the saw. Sets it on the counter, and he says, this saw don't work no good. So what are you talking about? He said, I tried the saw. He says, I did everything I could with the saw. He says, it does not do a cord in just a short period of time. It took me two days to cut a cord with this saw. He said, are you kidding? No. You try it yourself. So all of a sudden the storekeeper comes up and he, boom, vroom, gets that motor going. And that poor Canadian goes, what's that noise? <laughs> Can I tell you in both these illustrations... That's a picture of Christians sometimes. See, we can have all the wattage we want, but unless we're plugged into power, we can't even turn it on. It's just that simple. Jesus said in John 15, 5, I am the vine, you're the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, he bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. I got to tell you, one of the things that the Lord is just showing me, for those of you that uh, are catching it by television, you're actually not here, um, because we abbreviate our service for you so you're not sitting there for two and a half hours. Although you guys might have to come sit. What I believe God is wanting Christians to do in our last days, in these last days, and I've, I know all the pastors in the, our church is right here, we need to get back to the principles found in the first century Christian, which means this. You are Christian 24-7. It doesn't matter where you are. It doesn't matter where you go. It doesn't matter who you're around. It doesn't matter anything. You are a Christian. You are filled with Jesus Christ's Spirit. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 13, 5, test yourself to, need, to see if you're in the faith. Know this about yourself, that Jesus Christ is in you unless indeed you fail the test. Now, I don't know about you, but when heaven sent perfect Spirit comes into this body who has been racked with sin most of his life, touches me, there's a difference, and it should be noticeable. Hallelujah. Things change. Amen? Amen? Hallelujah. I shouldn't look like the world. I mean, I kind of do in a sense. That I, you know, I'm a man, and I don't look like a, you know, I'm a weird alien with things coming out of my head. But the point being is this. There should be a difference. As a matter of fact, here's one of the things that we've noticed in, jo in John, Acts chapter 10 that's noticeably different than the world. We should be people who love to communicate with our all-powerful ever-knowing, amazing, everywhere-present God as often as we can. Because if you don't pray, basically, or if you don't have a habit of praying, basically what you're saying is, I am God, I do not need direction from anyone. 
Yeah, I know, it's very strong. But it's very real. Picture this for just a moment. Come on, think about this. We just read chapter 10. It's an amazing chapter. It's a powerful chapter. It's one of those, it's one of those turn the course of history on its back kind of a chapter. Some of you may not realize that, but as we go through Acts, you will know this when I'm done. This is one of the most amazing, one of the most profound chapters in the entire book of Acts. Here's why. As you notice, when, when Peter, just a little background history, when Peter went to the Gentiles, he did two things. Number one, he didn't go until he was commissioned from the Lord to go into a Gentile's house. Number two, he took witnesses with him to make sure everything was going to be done appropriately. Why? Because he said, he, I believe, was uh, quoting uh, Leviticus, he said that it's not lawful, meaning he can't associate and go into a house of an unbelieving Gentile. That would be wrong. How many of you are Jewish in here? Raise your hand. For those of you by television, there's not one Jewish person in here. Do you know that if it were not for this, quite possibly we wouldn't be here today? Quite possibly. Now, God has plans, and he wanted the Gentiles. He said in the Psalms, speaking of Christ, ask of me, and I shall give the nations unto you as an inheritance. Amen? Amen? That was a direct father-son conversation that we are privy to. But here's the point. Cornelius wasn't even saved. But he had a fear of the God of the Jews to the point where as a Gentile, you know, Gentiles weren't even allowed to go to church. Come on now. They could not participate like a Jewish man or a Jewish woman, in any of the sacrifices or anything. They weren't allowed. They were segregated from enjoying the presence of God as a Jewish person. And he would give alms to the Jews. He helped build a synagogue who he probably wasn't allowed to go in. Could you imagine? You love God so much and you're distanced from him. But yet you give money to put a church up in a synagogue you can't even attend. Generally. I mean, there were Gentiles that would go into synagogue, but you know what I'm saying. It wasn't his religion, so to speak. He wasn't Jewish. But he was a man of prayer. Could you imagine? An angel came to a Gentile's house before Peter went, and said, your alms and your prayer has gone up as a memorial before God. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine that? And he was specific with a Gentile unbeliever at the moment. Here's what you need to do. You need to send somebody over to Joppa. There's a man named Simon who's also called Peter. He's staying at a tanner's house who's also named Simon. And he lives by the sea. Go get him and bring him here. So you know, the centurion's like, oh, whoa. You and you. And uh, my God that I trust, you guys go. Go get this guy. And so they do. Now, that's only half the story. So now they've got quite a little hike to go to get to Joppa from Caesarea. And so while Peter is in Caesarea, possibly the next day, It's around noontime. He's getting hungry, and he's standing up on the roof of the house, and he's praying. He's interceding. Now, during his prayer time, an interesting thing happens. The Bible is very clear. It says that this great big old, what looked like a sheet of a sort, was let down from heaven, and it had all kinds of animals on there. And God knew that this was the way he would get a hold of of Peter's attention. Because Even Peter didn't fully understand the vision until he was in Cornelius' house and they got baptized and filled with the Holy Spirit. He goes, now I know that God is basically not partial to any. Right? So he sees this sheet coming down with all kinds of food on it or animals on it. And then this voice comes from heaven. Peter, kill and eat. Now Peter, being the good Jew that he was, said, Lord, 
I have never eaten anything unclean. If you want to know what the dietary laws are for a Jewish person, you can go right in the book of Leviticus. It'll give you every dietary law that they were allowed to eat and what they weren't allowed to eat. Pork chops were not part of it. It wasn't. Chocolate-covered ants were not a part of it. So Peter says, Lord, I have never eaten anything unclean. And the Lord said, whatever I clean is clean. Now this didn't just happen once. This didn't just happen twice. The Bible says that it happened three times. You know what that means? He wanted to make sure that Peter understood there was something dynamic about to happen. He wanted Peter totally competent comprehensive, if you will, of this vision. He didn't know too much about it except for the vision. And so at the end of the vision, there's something unique that happens. And here's what it is. While Peter was reflecting on the vision, verse 19, the Spirit said to him, Behold, three men are looking for you. Arise, go downstairs, and accompany them without misgivings, for I have sent them myself. Now, as Christians, those of us baptized filled with the Holy Ghost, how come we're not getting this kind of stuff? Could it be we're so busy, we don't have time to pray? We don't have time to stand in the presence of God? Or we wait until something comes up where we can be, or, a, I mean, a real devastating situation comes up in our lives, and all of a sudden we are prayer request crazy. And there's nothing wrong with being prayer request crazy when something wrong in your life. Please don't misinterpret what I'm saying. What I'm saying is this. As Christians, think about the relationship you have with your spouse, those of you that are married, with your children, those of you that have children. Could you imagine going an entire week without talking to them? How long do you think you'd stay married? So some of us, I wonder how long we go without praying. And then we wonder why God doesn't talk to us. Or better yet, maybe we're not even in his word, so we wouldn't recognize if it was his voice or Satan's in the first place. Yeah, I'm talking to you too in there. It's time, ladies and gentlemen. It's the last days. My prayer is, is that by example, we're on fire for Jesus. And what on fire for Jesus means is that we're spending time in His Word because we love Him. We're spending time in prayer because we love Him. We're ready for marching orders when He gives them. And then we allow His confirming Word to take place so that we know it's Him. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. If God didn't prepare Peter the way He did and didn't tell him to go, do you think Peter would have gone? Mm -hmm. No, he even said, hey, it's not lawful for me to be here. Hmm. You know, I had a pretty cool experience yesterday. So I was here for food pantry. And this is my second time that I had the opportunity to hang out with the food pantry folks. Ursula was very kind. She did a quick uh, tutorial on how to do a food pantry thing that I was doing that thing. Anyways, so people are coming in, and uh, we had what I would consider a pretty good crowd, but I'm not used to, not sure how many people or whatever. And the reason I'm telling you this story, there is a reason. And so all of a sudden, you know, because of COVID, we separate all that kind of stuff, masks on and everything. And so there's only two allowed in the old fellowship room, which is uh, kind of beneath over there. And so the two that are allowed in the fellowship room, one is allowed to get their product, and the other one just sits and waits. And so, and then Pastor Cindy is over at the table over there, and she's doing whatever she's doing with paperwork and, and all that kind of stuff. And, and uh, you know, I was doing some arm of the paperwork. And so anyways, uh, Pastor Cindy, uh, I don't know how she got in a conversation with this woman, but her name is Carrie. And I'm telling you her name so you can pray for her. 
So Carrie happened to be sitting on a chair, minding her own business. Now, I don't know these people. Not a one of them. And Cindy says, Pastor Kevin, and she introduces me to, to her. She says, Pastor Kevin, she said she didn't want prayer, but she needs prayer. And she said she lost somebody close to her last month. I turn and look at her, and her eyes are welling up with tears. I'm a pastor. What am I going to do? I said, Cindy, you do it. No, I'm kidding. I prayed with her. I know nothing about her past. I know nothing about her life. That doesn't sit well with me as a Pentecostal pastor. So after we prayed, I couldn't help but ask her questions. How many of you know I can ask a lot of questions? Like lots. And I began to ask her questions, and one of the questions was, you know, what's your background with God? You ever go to church? Nope, never been to church. Wasn't raised in church. Hmm. What do you think about Jesus? So she began to tell me what she thought about Jesus. And so her number got called or whatever. Fran and, and uh, uh, Pat were in the, the, the kitchen part, and they're just scurrying around, and, and, and I could tell that they were praying because here's Pastor sharing the gospel with this lady. And... Uh, I even wonder if they kind of slowed down their process because they were flying at, you know, at some point. I'm thinking they might have slowed down to allow me to talk, allow me to ask questions. But listen very carefully. If Pastor Cindy didn't say anything to me, I would not have shared the gospel with her probably. So Pastor Cindy was sensitive enough and bold enough to tell me that this lady needed prayer and Why? And then I felt in my spirit as I was praying for her, because Pentecostals feel things in their spirit when you're praying. You know that, right? If you don't get Pentecostal, you'll feel things in your spirit when you're praying. Hallelujah. Anyway, I felt like God wanted me to take her on the journey to learn about what it means to be born again. Long story short, I'm standing at the counter with her. We're just about finished our conversation. She said to me, she said, nobody has ever answered these questions for me before. How old would you say that lady was? Lady, possibly in her 50s, USA has never had the answers given to her about what it means to be born again. Here in Lebanon, here in this church, they came to the church. And then she said to me, she goes, you know, I've had other, and she named a religious group, come to my door, and and there's questions they can't even answer. I said, well, like what? And she said this, she said, listen, she says, God, you know, Jesus was here, and she told me about Jesus, and I understand, you know, there's things about him that can point to him being here, but God, you can't see God. And so I said to her, I said, you can't see oxygen either, and you can't taste it, see it, smell it, feel it, or anything, but it sustains life, doesn't it? And all of a sudden, she's just staring at me like I just spoke something to her. And it wasn't me. It was the Holy Spirit. But then, there was a little bag of bread over here. So I grabbed a bag of bread. I didn't even look. I just grabbed it. And I set it on the counter. And I said this. I said, I didn't see anybody make this bread. Did you? No. How do you know somebody made this bread? Because it exists, right? Yeah. Yeah. I put it back in the bucket. I grabbed the countertop and I said, I don't know, I didn't see anybody build this thing, but I know somebody did. Why? Because it's here. Yeah. I said, you know, I don't see God necessarily, but I see you, and the reason you exist is because He does. I said, think about it, you're not a robot. What I'm looking at is not who you are. Your flesh and body, your bones and blood. That's not who you are. It's your soul and your spirit. If you weren't a robot, we wouldn't have this conversation. It wouldn't matter. In her 50s, USA has never been explained the gospel because I explained what it meant. She knew and understood why Jesus came when we finished the conversation. She had never heard it before, mid-50s, in this community. 
ladies and gentlemen, that like rocketed my fire for wanting to get the gospel out to Lebanon, New Hampshire, because don't assume that even people my age knows Jesus because they don't. And they don't even understand. And she told me he came and he died. She didn't even know he rose from the dead till yesterday. Yes, thank you, Jesus, and forgive me. God wants to save people. God wants to save Gentiles. God wants to save Jews. God wants to save people. Amen? They went 96 miles. I went 35 in a very comfortable Jeep from Springfield to here yesterday for prayer and to hang out a little while in the food pantry. I was as cozy, comfy, and warm as you can be. They traveled a whole long distance to talk to some Gentiles from a vision. Uncomfortable. But you know what's cool? They saw results. I thank God for the food pantry. But I got to tell you, I think I'm going to start hanging out with food pantry folks on Saturdays. And do you know what my purpose is? To find another Carrie. I gave her a, bit, a, a little card for this church. She didn't know what our church phone number was. And I said, anytime you have any question, anytime, I don't care what that question is. I said, my hours are Monday through Thursday from 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. Call this church. I will talk to you all day long if I have to. Amen? You know what that takes? Somebody who loves Jesus. Hallelujah. I'm way off my text. I'm going to close with this. Did you ever notice that when a vine, remember going back to what Jesus said, I'm the vine, you're the branches? I think I'm pretty good with this here. So, do you ever notice that a vine, when it kind of goes along its merry way, just growing, doing its thing, and shoots begin to come out of the vine, right? Do you ever notice that the vine, as it shoots the branches out, the branches don't have any control to how they get shot out? In other words, those little branches can go up, they can go down, they can go east, they can go west, they can go north, they can go south, at the absolute control of someone else. Jesus said, I am the vine, you're the branches. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Do you know, apart from Jesus, Cindy would not have said anything to me. Apart from Jesus, I could not have communicated to that woman. Apart from Jesus, all of you folks that work the food pantry from time to time and sometimes committed, like some of you are there every single week, without Jesus, it wouldn't happen. Amen? So my question to you today is this. At 40,000 feet, we're looking at Acts chapter 10. We see Cornelius praying, and all of a sudden, he is surprised by a vision of an angel. And an angel says, send somebody to go talk to somebody. And then all of a sudden, a born-again believer, filled with the Holy Spirit, is seeking the Lord, and he's sensitive to the Spirit. And he gets a vision from the, from the Lord from heaven. And he's challenged and changed right there on his philosophy, his doctrine, his theology about non-believers, specifically Gentiles. He's changed. And all of a sudden the Spirit, to make sure that he gets this, said there are people that are coming. I want you to go with them without misgivings. In other words, don't hold back. Don't hesitate. Go with them. He didn't tell them where he was going. He didn't tell them how far it was going to be. He just said go. And he went with them. And then when he got there, he didn't even really know. The, I don't know what those guys talked about all the way down there, but he didn't even really know what the pro purpose was. He says, why am I here? Why did you send for me? You got a message. Do you know that what is interesting about you got a message? Peter didn't have to go, uh, 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 uh. 
Peter knew he was in the house of someone to hear the good news about the saving grace of Jesus Christ. And then to Peter's surprise, because remember, Peter's already getting programming in his head on how things should work and how they ought to be, right? It says it in the book, it's the surprise. And so were the guys with him. So as he's talking, could you imagine? I mean, I would love to be interrupted this way. He's preaching the gospel, and all of a sudden, the whole family, Cornelius and everybody, all of a sudden, they just start sputtering tongues, man. Could you imagine? It must have been electric in that house. It must have been powerful in that house. The Holy Spirit came on them just like he did on the disciples in the sense that they began to speak with other tongues. And the disciples were taken back, not because they were speaking with other tongues, but because they were Gentiles. They had no issue with the tongues. They saw it. We read last week how they saw it over and over again. They were sent to where Philip was. But man, oh man. Let me ask you a question. Are you as hungry as I am to be used of God? Because think about this. I'm 55 soon. I've mentioned this before. My father died. He was 71 years old. My mother was just barely 73. If I follow in my dad's footsteps, just for the sake of argument, I have 16 years left on the planet. 16. I don't know. God didn't tell me. I don't have an expiration date on my birth certificate. But my point being is this. If I were to die at 71 like my father did, and it was right after his birthday, August 13, 71, August 29, he's gone. Same year. As a matter of fact, he's Bruce Townsend's age. They were born the same year, same month. If that were to be my experience, I only have 16 years left. Do you know, ladies and gentlemen, how fast 16 years flies? What am I going to do with the last 16 years of my life, potentially? How motivated am I going to be? Am I going to be more concerned about how my 401k is doing or how somebody's eternity is doing? Am I going to be more excited about or more nervous about, you know, uh, this bill or that bill, so to speak? All of some are going to be wise, but my point is, or am I going to be more concerned about somebody else's eternity? Am I going to be so concerned about uh, I'm getting enough sleep or not enough sleep if the Lord calls me to pray? At a certain time, did you know that most times when uh, Christians are woken up at night, um, it's because maybe God wants you to pray for somebody? Amen? I don't know about you, but I want to see God move. I want to see God move. I want to see him save the upper valley. God gave me a beautiful picture yesterday, and, and, and I'd say me and only me, but as, and listen, i got to tell you, here's the other thing that's super, super awesome about Christians. I know when I was talking to that lady, because I peeked, I kind of was leaning like this on the little shelf over there, you know, and I looked, kind of peeked over here, and I noticed that there was a little gathering of Christians. And some of them had their eyes closed. What do you think they were doing? They were interceding in the throat of God. God, save her soul. God, save her soul. God, use Pastor Kevin. God, open her heart. I don't know what they were praying, but something like that. Amen? He's the vine. We're the branches. Apart from him, we can do nothing. Are you ready to do? Those of you by television, we're just about closed. I'm about to, to close this here in prayer, and I'm asking you this morning. Listen, in Lebanon, New Hampshire, I spoke to somebody who had never understood why Jesus came. They didn't even know that Jesus rose from the dead. And listen, I'm asking you, I'm begging you, Get a hold of our phone number. We're Cross Point Church, Assembly of God, Lebanon, New Hampshire. If you have questions like that, I don't care what they are, theological questions, I want you to call. I want to talk with you. I will spend as much time as I can. Again, Cross Point Church, Assembly of God, Lebanon, New Hampshire, I want you to call me. I want you to talk to me. I would rather you spend two hours on the phone with me and understand eternity and possibly see me on the other side with Jesus than forget the whole thing and stand up before God and wonder what happened. 
Amen? Amen. 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 Thank you, Leo. Go ahead. Those of us that are here, ladies and gentlemen, if you're here this morning and you do not know how to lead someone to Jesus, you do not know how to explain the gospel to people about why Jesus came. You know, Jesus came, listen, he didn't come for life enhancement. We do have life enhanced, but he didn't come for life enhancement. He came for the sole purpose, the specific purpose of leading people to the throne of grace, having a restored relationship with the God who has been at war with them since they sinned. It's like this. Pretty much in a nutshell what I told her. I said to her, I said, listen, I said, here's kind of how it works. When Jesus came, it would be like if I'm standing in front of a uh, judge here on earth and he were to just show me all the laws that I've broken. See, I've broken every single one of God's laws. Not just one law and breaking all ten. I broke everything. I broke every law that God had. Listen, I, uh, I was adulterous. I coveted. I, I stole. I've lied. In my heart, I've murdered. Come on now. And I didn't honor God. I didn't love God. I didn't, remind, I didn't remember the Sabbath. I used His name in vain. Come on. I have broken every single one of His commandments in my life. Some multiple times. Too numerous to count. But they're God's laws. And God is the giver of the laws. He's the judge of the laws. And he's the God who created me. So there's this turmoil, I believe, inner turmoil that took place in heaven. And so what happened was, is he sent his son to earth, sinless, died, rose again for my behalf. What does that mean? I'm standing before the judge. The judge says, dude, you've got some serious problems here. You've broken all these laws. And I'm looking at him, and I, I got nothing to say. I, I broke these laws, absolutely. And he says, million dollar fine. I could never in my life raise a million dollars. I don't even know people I could raise a million dollars for. And the judge says, unless you raise this money, you're going to jail, and you will not come out of jail until it's paid to the last cent. How many of you know I'd be in jail the rest of my life? All of a sudden, somebody I didn't know comes into the courtroom. He says, Your Honor, I have sold everything I had. I have given everything I had. Here's the million dollars to pay the debt to Kevin. Kevin, you can now go free. You see, that's what Jesus did 2,000 years ago when he was on that cross. He paid a debt. Ladies, we, gentlemen, we used to sing a song that we should sing again, reinvent this song. He paid a debt he did not owe. I owe a debt I cannot pay. Come on. I needed someone to wash my sins away. I needed someone to pay that fine. And so do you. And so do they. And the wonderful thing about that is this. You can't earn it. You can't do anything to gain God's favor to get it. All you can do is this. Jesus, I recognize that I have broken every single one of your laws. I am a sinner. That's what it means to sin, breaking God's laws. And Lord, if I were to stand before you on judgment day, I am in trouble. According to your law, I am guilty. I want to accept right now what your precious son Jesus did to take away the guilt from that sin because I deserve death. I deserve your jail, God. Did you know God has jail in heaven or in eternity? It's called hell. It's called the lake of fire. This is jail. Lord, I deserve your jail. And I'm asking you, I'm, I'm, I'm asking you, Lord, I want to accept the payment that you made on my behalf. You have taken my criminal behavior on your back. You were on that cross for hours. And not only do I want to accept that amazing payment that I could never pay for, I'm asking you, cleanse me from head to toe all of the sin that I have ever committed in my life. And you know what the beauty of it is? He will, he can, he does, and he'll continue to do so. 
Why? Because he's God. You have to ask him. You have to invite him.